So our team just went into the other areas. I still see quite a few people here. So I'm going to open up the Q&A. Well, actually, before I do that, let's take a moment. I would love, you know about me now. Hi. Hi, um, everyone. Chachaya, are you, are you listening to Megan's question in another window? I was. I no longer am. <laughs> I was like, why am I still hearing this? Awesome. Hi, everyone. And are we intended to have the closed captions on? I remember instructions to do that, but I haven't seen it in other sessions. So we could leave it on or we could turn it off. Yeah, so all the other sessions have had um, separate, like a separate captions tab. Um, I'll leave them on, folks can turn them off. I believe they're, the setting is like per user. So if they're annoying you, you can turn them off. Um, I love having them on. Yeah, me too. Um, can you all see me? My video is gray on my screen, but I'm okay to be. Oh, all right. I can't see you, Lena. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. You don't need to. It's a mess over here. <laughs> I, see, I see like the alien mark. That's that's what's coming through. Honestly, a cuter option. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, I see Lillian here, our wonderful community intern. Awesome. Bookie. Um, designer extraordinaire. Um, so much like the intro session, if you all could please drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, Baron, Chichilia, and myself will get to them. Um, but while you all think of your questions and type those out, um, I'm going to invite uh, everyone here to just introduce themselves, everyone on the stage, so Baron and Chichilia, to uh, introduce yourselves and um, talk a little bit about what you do here at Replit. Um, Chichilia, why don't you go first? Absolutely. Welcome, everyone. My name is Cecilia Zanidi, and I'm the general counsel and head of business development at Replit. Um, I joined because I was super excited about what we're doing. So 10 million users, 200 countries. You all have created uh, over 20 million websites and apps. We've indexed 100 million REPLs in search. Like just, I, I, I have almost goosebumps from this morning. But in terms of like, hiring and what we look for like this company is and what we're doing here is a little bit different and you know we have this thing that like we're just a little bit weird and and that actually makes working here super fun we've got this super strong mission and a little bit weird so how does that tie into business roles like you know so we have marketing which we can talk about and obviously you know lena is is here to talk about that um, on the business side, you know, we're, we're figuring out how that works. And, you know, just like Amjad had to figure out, um, you know, how to build Replit as a, as a IDE first, and then as a company now, um, you know, thinking about how to enable you all in creating apps and creating things to get to that path. That's what we're doing on the business side. Um, on the legal side, you know, super interesting. Think about, you know, you could think of Replit as an app store. You could think of Replit as, you know, a communication platform, a community, um, being all these things and being the place where people can develop software and have that creativity. There's a whole kind of legal um, and policy infrastructure around that. And also we're fully global. Um, so even just 10 years ago, you couldn't watch Netflix in a bunch of countries and now you basically can everywhere. So thinking about that move, that's another, another aspect. So that, that, that's me in a nutshell. I have, you know, tech experience at other companies and things like that, but just super excited to be here and answer questions. And I also, um, my kids use Replit. I, you know, am picking up coding a little bit. So I have that kind of like fresh learner mindset. So happy to, to share that with you all if I am um, to have this opportunity. Baron, can you introduce yourself too? Absolutely. Hey everyone, uh, good afternoon or evening or morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. My name is Baron Webster. I uh, lead the design team at Replit currently. I'm one of four designers uh, and we also have an illustrator on staff who I manage as well. Um, before Replit, I was leading design for emerging technology at Google, uh, helping researchers and uh, computer scientists figure out how their new technology kind of comes to the public um, and is brought to market. The design team at Replit is uh, pretty small. You know, we have kind of four designers. We're hoping to grow the team. Um, we've got a couple of roles open now, including design for mobile. Maybe some of you 
learned about uh, mobile from Lima's talk this morning or heard it mentioned in Amjad's keynote. And uh, we're also hiring um, a web and content designer who will be responsible for kind of designing the website, the public website of Replit, um, what people see when they land on replit.com for the first time. But uh, I live in New York. I have a, a cat who is kind of sitting next to me during the sessions and i um, excited to be here to answer any questions about the design team, the design process, um, how we hire and any of the roles that we have open. Nice to virtually say hi to everyone. Awesome, thank you both. Um, and my name is Lena. Um, I lead our community team here at Replit, which means that um, Essentially, we keep our community members happy and healthy, and we try and get more people to join our community as well um, through things like events, content, like events like this, obviously, uh, content like videos, tweets, um, tutorials, curriculum, you name it. Um, and then with partnerships. So you might have gone to Hat Club session earlier, or maybe to Code with Classy's session. Those are some of our partners who help us to grow our community to make it as vibrant and um, fun as possible. Um, and I'm also Lily's mentor. <laughs> um, uh, what can I say? So in terms of hiring, um, I guess you can, in, in community, you can think of it as we hire people to advocate for our distinct community areas. So for example, we have um, David Morgan, who you can, you can watch his session later today. Um, and he oversees our teacher community. So he does things like partner with teachers, um, edit and write curriculum, et cetera. And then we also have um, someone coming, well, we're also looking for and looking at people for um, emerging communities like women and international users. Um, and then there's probably other communities that you've seen on Replit. And so those are other areas where we'll be hiring people to kind of advocate for them. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I also live in New York, but I don't have a cat. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the Q and A. Uh, first one is for you, Baron. Do you offer design internships and what type of design tasks do you assign? Yeah, it's a great question. I also saw someone ask uh, if they could see my cat. So maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll give us a sneak peek <laughs> later. <laughs> I know that's the most important thing. Um, so, recruiting so, tool. Yeah, <laughs> we should have advertised that there will be cats in some of the talks. Um, it's a great question, uh, Rania. Do we, do we design, offer design internships? We, um, we do. Uh, we have uh, two design interns that are joining us for the summer. I think one of them is probably maybe on the call. Um, he's a community member, uh, Clement, uh, aka Bookie. Yeah, he says hi. Um, and we'll we're kind of bringing in one other intern for this summer. This is the first time that the team has been big enough to support uh, designed interns. So it's a bit of um, an exciting time because last year uh, during the summer, there were only two designers at the whole company. Um, it was just Tyler and I um, doing the design work and then Haya, our co-founder. Um, so the short answer is uh, yes, we're kind of getting our design internship program off the ground. We may figure out if it makes sense to do them outside of the summer, if people want to do them in the fall or winter or spring. As to the second part of the question, um, what type of design tasks uh, do you assign? It's actually less, um, less there's, it's less of an assignment process um, than it is the designers on the team working with the engineers and the product managers to figure out what makes sense to work on. Um, so I'm not kind of the design boss who's telling all the designers on the team exactly what they need to work on, but rather all the designers on the team are working on specific projects or specific features directly with the engineers and the product folks uh, to make sure that those features are really easily usable um, that the interfaces look good, that they're uh, you know, performant, uh, and that they're tested before we release them um, to the public. So the type of tasks that we um, kind of work on 
as a design team are kind of broken up by how tactical uh, the work is. So at a small level, we might work on individual parts of the UI, like a button or something. And then you can imagine kind of going up this ladder where things are more complicated the higher you go. So like one level up from individual UI elements is like the layout of an entire page. So, you know, even like the interface that you're looking at right now at Hopin, someone kind of laid out where the elements on the page go, uh, how they fit together, what you look at at a specific time. We do a lot of work on that. And then even above that, we think about what are the tasks that people want to accomplish on Replit? Um, what are the journeys that people are trying to kind of get through when they uh, join the platform? You know, do they want to make a game? Do they want to learn a new language? Do they want to share a project with their friends and family? And so we also work at kind of establishing which of those tasks are the most important for us to work on um, and how to kind of bring them to life. I hope that answers that question. I tried to transcribe all that, Baron, um, <laughs> but it is um, in that in answer to that question, and you can add more if you are um, if you think of anything else. Great. Um, uh, fed, fed, feed, um, as does community at Replit also manage social media accounts? Some of them, yes, some of them, no. We collaborate with um, the illustrious YK, who um, leads a lot of our YouTube and Twitter content, but it's a very collaborative process. Um, and then in terms of social media, that also covers like our teacher forum, um, that also covers our blog. And so we're kind of all over all of those things. Hope that it's, it's a little nebulous, but it's, we do a lot. Uh, Chichilia from Mohammed. How are you thinking about building TNS policy or similar functions at Replit? And I see you already answered it or no. Oh, you didn't. Okay. So I, go I said ahead. I was going to answer it live. Yeah. So thank you so much for the question, Mohammed. I actually have a, um, I have a, I put together a little slide in the background while, uh, while we were talking. So, uh, so let me put that up. All right. So trust and safety is basically like, there's a lot of different ways to think about it, but the way I think about it for Replit is like, how welcoming is the community? And as a company, the community is really like the ability to multiplayer code, the ability to share code, the ability to create code, the power that Amjad talked about this morning. That's really the core of who we are at Replit. So trust and safety is about making sure that when people come to the site and when people do all of those things, they feel you know welcome. And there's sort of three different components. So the way I think about building it is like, what is it like to be safe and welcoming? Like, what are the policies? So we saw this morning as an example, there was you know an abusive user during the uh, Amjad's talk. We swiftly took care of it. That kind of thing is like making sure that the discourse and, the, and that how people experience Replit um, keeps them engaged and coming back and excited to share. Um, when we think about actually building the team though, we have to meet users where you are. So I can't remember if it's you or somebody asked like, hey, you know, Lena, do you go on other social media channels? Like we know that the discord is like where a lot of folks hang out and we, you know, and we love it. And the creativity that we see like when it's this morning, amazing. And so when we think about trust and safety, it's about meeting users where they are within the product features. So I work with folks like Baron on the design side and then with engineering and the team that I'm building will be doing that and partnering very closely with Lena and the community team to have these features and meet them where they are. So as an example, you know, some of you have uh, run into H within the forums. You know, he's built a lot of tools around kind of reporting a REPL, around taking down REPLs that have some kind of issue. And then similarly, we're thinking a lot on the algorithmic side. You all have seen search with Lincoln. It's like, when you search for a REPL, exposing those good REPLs, you know, allowing the ability for the community's voice to come through. It's really meeting the users where they are. And then the third thing, of course, we're an engineering company, right? So we saw from Amjad that, that um, uh, you know, the very roots of Replit is like, how can we, you know, make engineering and make creating software easier? And so, 
hand in hand with that is the technical solution. So as an example, check out Amjad's Twitter. He gave a great story around um, fighting with essentially Bitcoin miners and hackers who were uh, attacking Replit and coming up with technical solutions to that. And that aspect of fraud prevention, you know, when you think about the scale, we talked about 100 million Repls. You know, we can't use human solutions. We're going to use engineering solutions and we're going to do things that platforms like, um, you know, Roblox or others build those systems in. So architecting that is a strong partnership and it's kind of part of the DNA of our company that we've been doing a long time. You can imagine also if we're talking about monetizing and thinking of how you all can, um, you know, how the community can actually um, eventually incorporate payments and things like that into Replit. Um, that's just something that's going to be a, a, a big, I guess, opportunity for us. Um, I don't know if you have specific questions. I haven't been looking at the chat since I've had the screen on, but um, that's kind of the basics of how, how I think about it. Would love to take follow-up questions if you'd like. All right. Yeah, feel free, uh, Mohammed, if you have follow-up questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to those in order. Um, I have a quick one for, oh, I've, I see a question from Davis, can a 10-year-old become a member? Um, do you mean a member of Replit or of our team? Replit is technically for, is legally for users 13, so Julie, you can answer this better than I can. 13 and up? 14? Yeah, so, um, so uh, one of the uh, uh, things that we think about is, um, you know, regulations around uh, using Replit of different ages. Um, and uh, I guess the exact question was, was what ages to be? Like, so in the United States, there's a law called COPPA. And so our Teams for EDU product, um, if you use Replit in a school setting, uh, is, is set up to comply with that. Okay. All right, that's a quick one. We've got another quick one. For you, Baron, how does Replit hire artists? Um, I'm sure you've seen Joe's work, my tree. It's very amazing. Yeah, yeah, I can take this one. Um, so the short answer is uh, we have one artist <laughs> right now. Um, so we haven't had to kind of decide uh, what our hiring process is for, for artists and illustrators um, because we're lucky enough that our needs for art right now are um, kind of covered. We work with a really talented guy named Joe, um, who's actually based in Australia. Uh, and most of the art that you see around the site or on Twitter or YouTube, any of our kind of social media channels is mostly done by Joe. Um, and the way that we kind of hired Joe is that we found him, um, actually Amjad found his work, I think on Instagram a couple of years ago um, and just liked his style. And so we occasionally would hire Joe uh, as a freelancer to work on just one or two projects. You know, when we were launching something, we'd want a cool image or a cool little animation to show off what we were launching. And eventually we were just working with him so often uh, that it made more sense to just bring him on full-time um, and hire him. So that's kind of the historical way that it's happened. In the future, maybe if the team keeps doubling every year, maybe we'll uh, need more artists and then I'll have to figure out what the process is for bringing them on. Um, hiring artists and illustrators is especially uh, challenging because every artist has their own visual style. And when you think about how you want to kind of represent your uh, product or company, usually you want it to be relatively consistent so that it feels the same um, kind of no matter what advertisement or what uh, image you see of it. So that's uh, that's something that it will be a good problem to have <laughs> if we ever get big enough that we need to hire more artists. Um, so I hope that kind of answers uh, answers the question. All right, moving on through unanswered questions. Sean, hi, Sean. Um, he asks, let's see, I was excited to see this week that you'll be offering Teams for EDU free. Yes. 
Um, what plans do you have for growing this aspect of Repla and do you anticipate hiring additional roles to support it with David? Um, right now we are, we've just hired David. Um, we have a couple of teacher community moderators coming through as well. Um, we'll see how the community grows based on this new announcement and we'll adjust um, our team as needed. I think a theme of any hiring talk you're probably going to today is that Replit's growing really, really fast. Um, so keep refreshing our careers page um, and stay up to date um, for when we're hiring because it's it all just depends on need and on the growth. So yeah, stay tuned, John. Uh, okay, we had a business one for Chichilia. Uh, where is it? I miss it. Oh, okay. Um, oh gosh. Okay. Do you have an idea of when there may be more marketing or growth openings at Replit? I know, Chichili, you're kind of leading the like marketing part um, and growth. So maybe you can answer that. Yeah. So um, basically, we, up until now, in general, at the company, we've been very engineering focused, and the community has grown, um, you know, largely around people loving the tool and loving to use Replit. And now we're sort of realizing that, like, there's so much amazing potential in re reaching you all, and then all of our global users. So, as an example, you know, our um, mobile usage in Indonesia is like, I think it's north of 25% of the folks that use Replit do so on mobile. So we're thinking about like, how do we, what kinds of things do we do both in the product and in terms of evangelizing uh, Replit to those users. But in terms of actual roles, um, you know, we are in a position where we're super scrappy and posting roles as they come. And so I can tell you, even within my team, and I don't know if Baron and, and Lena can, can, kind of corroborate, like, I can't get the roles path posted fast enough because it's like, I'm writing the JDs and it's like, no, I can only do four or five interviews a week. I can't do, you know, third time interviewing and it's exhilarating. It's kind of fast growth startup. And so, you know, also super excited to have, you know, everyone here listening to this talk, but like that initiative, just like Megan said at the beginning, you know, I didn't realize until I got into a super high growth startup, how much of it is like, yeah, you know, we'll write JDs. But it's also like, if you have something to contribute, you know, tweet, like we hired someone. Um, so Soren literally was cold outreach to Amjad. Amjad is very open that his email address is Amjad at. And so, you know, and all of us, you know, shocker, all our email addresses is also, you know, first name at, right. And so if you have a project, you know, similarly with Joe reached out to him on Instagram as Baron just shared, um, you know, Definitely within marketing, we um, we have a head of marketing role open. Um, you know, when that person is hired, I assume they're going to be hiring up a team. You know, areas that you might think we would be, you know, have interest in. They're, they're not on my team. Our head of growth is Patrick, who you've probably seen on Twitter, Patrick Coleman. Um, feel free to reach out to him. But also other things we have, um, you can imagine SEO. So as an example, we announced all these awesome things today, right? So new templates. You can imagine, you know, you can have something that's like, um, you know, closuretemplate.com or, you know, even literally somebody searches for something and we love that magical experience of like, it's easy to set up, you dive right in. So all that I would put in the bucket of sort of marketing and growth. And so long winded answer, but yes, we absolutely have marketing and growth roles open. We might not have the exact roles that fit you, but don't be shy. Like Megan said, just like, reach out, start adding value, thinking about the community, because we absolutely reach and hire people that way. Uh, Tade, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, um, asks, what are Replit's plans for developer relations roles? Are they integrated across teams or part of a particular team? Currently, um, DevRels exist within community and social media. So I think someone had asked about like who manages our social media and I was like, multiple people. So that's similar for DevRel. Um, as I said before, uh, folks on the community team are really advocates for their, their various types of user groups. Um, and so you can consider those, 
those particular positions, DevRel positions. Um, and then is YK's title technically DevRel? Editor in cheese. Good it's question. A title. I, yeah, <laughs> I think it's just YK. <laughs> YK, yeah, YK. Um, so I, I think they are integrated across teams, um, specifically within the within those those two groups. Okay. Um, Baron, can we just see your cat so that we can I can mark the answer? <laughs> yeah, she's <laughs> she's napping. Oh, man. oh, look, she's, she's like saying hi. She's hi. like, I didn't prepare slides for this. Yeah. <laughs> I have this little corner next to my computer where she like, uh, it's nice and soft and she likes to hang out while I'm working. I love it. I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I should have, I should have warned her. Um, Bookie asked a great question. Um, you're in that horrible part of school where everyone's like, so what do you want to do with your life? Um, I'd like to work somewhere in the field of the web, more design than backend. Are scientific subjects like math, physics, or biology important or necessary? Oh, good question. I'm going to let Baron and Chichulia take that. Yeah, this is, a good, this, is a good, this is like a good general question too. It's not just about like design. Um, uh, and I think also everyone has kind of a different take on it. Um, like I can, my personal experience has been um, that I didn't take a lot of courses like that past high school. Uh, I, a little bit of my background, I went to art school, um, which you can imagine is not highly rigorous in mathematics or biology. Um, and so most of what I kind of focused on at school was design, writing, uh, you know, visual communication. And I actually picked up programming like on the side. Um, that was something that I never took a class in and was just interested in and learned um, uh, by trying things out and making a ton of mistakes. Um, and it's part of why I work here now is because I relate to the, the problem that programming I think is still too hard to learn. Um, so I think like my short answer is um, they're not necessarily uh, necessary for all types of roles but i do strongly believe that like any amount of knowledge you pick up in uh adjacent fields will always just inform the greater uh mental models you have and like the tools with which you can approach different scenarios so if you're approaching like a design problem that you're not necessarily sure how to solve if you've studied physics or history or biology sometimes you can kind of look at other uh, fields and other realms of knowledge to think of different approaches um, or things that have worked or haven't worked in the past. Um, like I'm personally really interested in like economics and the history of economics and debt um, and do a lot of reading kind of in those fields on the side. And while it doesn't directly impact my ability to like design an interface, it does kind of just provide more knowledge um, that I have to kind of approach higher level problems. So when we start thinking about things like, uh, you know, money on Replit and and earning uh, earning things on Replit, uh, there's just more knowledge that's kind of bouncing around my head that I can turn to bear. But I'm curious, like also Cecilia and Lita, like is it, it, it is a really interesting and broad question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so my, that actually kind of relates back to my story to joining Replit. So I'm, you know, a little older than the average employee here. And, you know, I grew up in the nineties in the Midwest and girls coding and girls in STEM at the time was not a thing, Allium, you know, and I was always sort of like, you know, a smart girl, but I was really encouraged much more with like reading and social science and, you know, economics and fields like this. And, you know, I, 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 I don't say that I regret it. And now I work with engineers every day and I've developed a technical discipline, which is law, um, you know, but having the ability to build and create and actually code yourself, it is a huge unlock, right? And that's kind of what we're doing here at Replit is like, you know, if you learn how to code from a very young age or even, you know, in a school setting or not, um, 
you have something, a skill like riding a bike or whatever it is, where you have a certain power that others don't. So there's a guy named Naval who's quite famous online. And his idea is like, if everybody could create software for any problem, what would the world look like, right? So his thing is like, okay, let's say, for example, I have, uh, I have uh, four kids and one of them is a young baby. And there's an app now where you can basically track nap times. And it essentially uses AI to predict when the sweet spot is for nap. So the app is called Huckleberry. Even just five years ago, 10 years ago, such an app would not have been possible. And when you think about the founders of that, they had that technical discipline, that ability to create an app for some problem that they had, that it turns out every person on earth has, i.e. they were once a child who napped. That's really powerful. Now, what that means for your own career, I 100% agree with Baron that like, it's really that intellectual curiosity and like be learning something. I majored in economics and international relations. The reason I got into tech was I saw a poster in my dorm work from home, 10 pounds an hour because I lived in London at the time, review chats um, and, you know, great tech job. I saw that I applied. It turns out it was the live stream for Manchester United soccer team. And at the time in the early 2000s, that was pretty innovative. And like, there's no school that necessarily would have prepared me for that. But that gave me that tech side. And then I had that critical thinking side from just what I had been studying. And I I can say like, for me, you know, I'm old enough now that I've seen some of that bare fruit of like, when you have this expertise or this experience in other areas, you become very good. Um, at making connections. And it's particularly true of innovative companies. So like for your own self, should I major in math? If you don't enjoy it, you know, no, but it is important, at least my experience to have some technical um, discipline, whatever it is, it could be art, it could be, um, you know, math, it could be law, whatever it is, because that will give you that kind of grounding. Um, The other fun one to talk about there, and I'm sure you all have seen it, but Google Steve Jobs commencement speech. And he talks about making these connections over time in a career. He took a calligraphy class at university and you're like calligraphy, whatever, that's so quaint. As it turns out, that's why he's into rounded rectangles. And that's why he's so into design. And it's like the power of that, like, it's amazing, you know? And so like, nobody would have told him, hey, it's good for your career to take calligraphy, but it turned out to be. Does that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm not looking at the chat, but that, that's kind of my thoughts. TLDR, expand your mind. The world is big. You never know what's going to come at you. <laughs> um, but also, it's the most motivating to pursue things you're interested in, right? So it's a balance. All right. Um, someone asked, could these type of jobs still be open in five or 10 years as I'm technically still a child and might be interested in having a job at Replit in my twenties? I really hope so. I hope we'll be able to continue hiring people long, long, long into the future. So stay tuned. Okay. Another question. How does the community team surface user feedback and how is it for your team to get buy-in from product to build things the community wants? Yes. So this is... Um, we are still pretty small. And so, um, lines of communication are really open between our teams. Um, we do get feedback from everywhere. And so sometimes it can be hard to like funnel that somewhere specific. Um, you know, like people are in discord with their feedback. People are literally in in our YouTube video comments with their feedback. Um, and so a big part of our work is like seeing across all of these platforms and funneling it to the right place so that they all exist in one place. Um, It's also important that we have people who know each of our communities really well. So like the wonderful Nathan, who I think is in the room, um, knows our Discord community very, very well, as does H. Um, And so when we want to talk to folks there, we know who to ask. Um, And then David and myself are really familiar with our teachers. So just like, oh, I know a teacher who encountered that because I'm just emailing and meeting with them. Um, And then to get buy-in from product to build things the community wants, 
yeah, people are really open-minded on our team. Um, we de- we definitely need to like see a need. It's it's hard to get uh, prod and engineering buy-in if it's like one teacher or one user who's like, I really need this one specific tool. That won't really happen. But if we see that there's a need across a lot of people, it's that there's a lot a large impact, we'll do it. Um, yeah, I would say it is. And then it, it also depends on like the timing. So we have pods um, and essentially you can like, you work for a bit of time in a pod on a specific project and anyone can propose a pod. It doesn't have to be a, a PM or an engineer or whatever, it can be anyone. And so if we see a need, we'll like compile a super team and then have do a pod proposal. And if it's um, accepted, then we'll spend the next month or so on that pod and working on it. So ideas are ideas from everyone are really embraced here, which I really love. All right. Okay. Um, for Chachulia, can you zoom in on how the team is thinking about monetization and more broadly about the business model? Uh, Replit is such a unique product, and I'm sure there are m- many potential avenues while also keeping the Replit community in mind. That's from Batsal. Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, first, a, a, a resource that some of you may not know about, this article here that I'm dropping in the chat um, was written by a, a venture capitalist named Packy McCormick, and it goes into really in depth, what is the potential of Replit? And what are the strategies that we could use to monetize? But essentially, I can go over the, the sort of three main components of the strategy. Um, here we go. All right, so bringing the next billion software creators online. That's the mission, that's what Amjad talks about, that's what we're so excited about. Um, and how we'll do that? We'll, give the building blocks for the software creator economy. The software creator economy, the biggest version of that that I can probably think of is like the Apple App Store, right? So in the Apple App Store, there's millions of apps and they can be monetized in a bunch of different ways. But the person deciding how that monetization happens is the developer. So in this case, the Replit user. You create your REPL, you create an app, you know, you create a version of Wordle, let's say, you could make it subscription, you could make it however you want. And our mission at Replit or what we're trying to do is to empower the community to decide on that. So there's kind of three components to that. One is ubiquitous environment. So you can code on mobile, you can code in Indonesia, you can code in the US, you can code wherever. And basically allowing you to be able to create wherever, we think the monetization would come from that. Just like the internet, or YouTube made it very easy to monetize creating video. Replit, our eventual idea is to make it very easy to create and eventually monetize creating software. Um, so community, like we just see a ton of power in a social network. So as an example, you know, uh, Facebook, they didn't make money for I think six, seven, eight years into their creation. Um, similarly for Google, right? Like. Does anybody remember? I remember the first time I used Google. It was right around when I worked in London. And, you know, they didn't even have ads at the time. I Googled my name and it found my high school journalism articles on, you know, my random high school website. That power was incredible. So basically, like, there will be something there with from the value that you all have um, in community. And then three is infrastructure primitive. So this is what I talked about. Like you can even imagine Replit as like, even like AWS, right? Like right now, all our storage is free. Um, and, you know, you can buy additional things with subscriptions. But the point is, is that like, it will become clear from community and our job, the way we're thinking about it is empowering you all to tell us. Long answer, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's it. Okay, there is one in the Q&A that I really want to address um, from Yuli. I was always told that programming was boring and just copy and paste and the same thing over and over again. What is your opinion on this statement? 
first of all, I think you should definitely go into our engineering uh, networking session and ask them because they will, they love programming. Um, as Baron and Chichilia have mentioned, and this is true for myself as well, programming is not like our, our first calling. Um, but it's still really exciting. I think that there's ways that you can find um, a lot of joy in it. So I used to be a, um, and I still kind of am, an educator. And I taught high schoolers how to code, um, just HTML, CSS, and JS, not just. It was pretty cool. Um, but I taught in museums, and it was for a lot of people and young people who didn't really think that programming was for them. They thought it was kind of boring, or I should say coding, because HTML is not a programming language. Anyway, um, they, they were like, this is not for me. I would much rather write and read. I love history. And so we invited them in and said, yeah, you can do all those things. You know, we're, we'll make projects about women's history. We'll do research. Um, you can be creative and use CSS to like make your website your art. Um, and they would build websites about their research. And so a lot of them walked away being like, oh, I just did something. I had no idea I could do this. I had no idea it was collaborative or that it was fun or that it was creative. And that was like the first of, of many um, coding projects that they did. And a lot of them, I love seeing where they're at now because um, so many of them have leveled up. So it is definitely not uh, boring and copy and paste. It could be if that's what you're making it to be, but there are so many ways to apply it in interesting and exciting ways in your life. Um, maybe solve a problem that you see in your community with code. Um, maybe make a game or make art with something like P5 or Kaboom. Um, so you can make it matter so it's not boring. That's my take. I don't know if Baron or Chichilla, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, my, uh like I think it depends on um, how you kind of encounter programming for the first time. Like if you're encountering it in a, a context where like you have to solve problems that you're not excited about. I think it's the same with like learning a lot of skills like math or writing. Like if your English teacher is making you write an essay on something you don't care about, um, you you might be bored. <laughs> but if you're writing like a story, uh, for your friends or family, or if you're writing uh, an essay about a topic you're really excited about, it, the same skills uh, kind of transcend from boring into like a, a creative medium for you. And that's kind of how I think about programming. You can totally bore yourself with it, um, but you can also use it as a way to kind of express yourself. Thanks for the question, Yuli. Again, go talk to the engineers. <laughs> they will also have their own takes on this. Just, oh, I'm just gonna check the time. We have three minutes. Oh my goodness. Um, I think the best thing to do now would be, we'll take one more question. And then while we do that question, I will put our careers link um, and then do you guys mind if I share your emails in here or what's best? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine okay. with me. You can share my email or my Twitter. Um, oh yeah. yeah, let's do Twitter. That's a little better. Um, so we'll share that. And then that way you all can contact us if you have more questions or you can tag us if we said something that like really resonated with you. Um, okay, last question is for Baron. What does the workflow look like between the designers and UX team and the engineering teams? And Baron, I'll take care of your contact stuff in the chat. Great. Yeah, this is a, this is a good question. Uh, we're really lucky at Replit right now in our composition of the design team um, because all of the designers that we have on staff right now are also programmers. Uh, now, all of us are not amazing engineers. Myself, I'm not like an amazing engineer, um, but we're all uh, skilled enough to be able to write a little bit of code and to be able to deploy uh, basic kind of design projects um, in the kind of products. And what that kind of allows us to do is be a lot closer with the engineers in the product development cycle. So a lot of kind of traditional 
design um, workflows happen in segments where you have like a design stage where the designers are working on what the idea will be and what it'll look like, whether it's like apparel or a book or a website. And then it gets handed off to like developers or engineers or production. Um, the way that we work is pretty, uh, it's much more tightly coupled. So for a project, uh, the designers, the engineers, and the product managers will all work together for six weeks on the project. And it's not sequenced. What that means is that when the project starts, everyone is kind of talking together about what the requirements are, um, how to best kind of implement the idea, what are the technical limitations um, from a kind of infrastructure side, what are the, uh, what are the pieces of data that we want to kind of check um, as we're building this. And that conversation happens between all of the different disciplines. It's not just designers in a corner doing the design or engineers in the corner doing the engineering. Often some of our best design ideas um, come from engineers or product managers uh, or like technical ideas will come from, from designers. And what that also lets us do is after that kind of first week or two, when we're actually building the project, it means that we're not gonna be surprised. Um, it means that like the engineers already have an idea of kind of where the design is headed. The designers have an idea of what technology is possible. Um, and so it's much less likely that you'll get like four weeks into a project and realize that the design that's been kind of approved is actually technically impossible or infeasible. Um, so as the project rolls along, designers are kind of constantly checking and working with the engineers um, as it's being like shipped. Um, and then when it kind of rolls out, it's kind of everyone's responsibility to, to make sure it goes well, um, to make sure that it's usable uh, and that the people that are using it kind of understand how it works and how to find it. So I hope that's a quick answer. Um, the short answer is like, it's, it's kind of all of us working together all the time. <laughs> uh, and there's no kind of concrete like handoff process. That's awesome. Yeah, I think what a good note to end on is is collaboration. Um, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Please do reach out if you have further questions or want to chat some more. We really appreciate all of you uh, being here during your lunchtime to, to hear from us. Or your morning or your overnight time. Oh my gosh, yeah, your midnight snack, Lily's midnight snack. <laughs> appreciate you. Lily. All right. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.